tyranny that is ruling over someone with your foot on their throat and making a demand that you shut up and do what you're told or face the punishment. Much of theology is rooted in the idea that God is a tyrant, that he has his foot on your throat and that he's making demands of you and that you comply with those demands or else. But if you believe that Jesus is the exact image of the nature and character of God and that he expressed who the Father was and that to see him was to see the Father, then you're going to see that Jesus never, under any circumstances, presented himself as a tyrant. And in fact, he overturned the idea of ruling by tyranny and replaced it with one of ruling by serving. And he replaced the idea that was commonly held of a theology of reversal and replaced it with the theology of equality. And so these are ideas in the New Testament that flip on their head the commonly held ideas because it was very much a principle at the time that the Messiah was going to come he was going to overthrow their oppressors, and he was going to establish Jerusalem as the political cap capital of the world. And there's much in the Old Testament that sings praises to the fact that the foot of the oppressor on their throat was going to be replaced by their foot on the throat of their former oppressors. It was a theology of reversal and a theology of revenge and Jesus replaced that by saying, no, you don't understand. In the end, everything equals out. In the end, everyone gets paid the same. This is really what Paul was writing about when he talked about the branches being grafted in, was he was also doing the same thing and flipping this idea of reversal because he starts out presenting it as a reversal that this branch is cut off and this branch is grafted in, but he's saying, ultimately, all branches are grafted in. That's really what he was getting at in that passage. So it's the same kind of an attack on the theology of reversal. And so we're going to take a look at these concepts and how they knit together and how when you throw out the idea of a god who is a tyrant, then it destroys much of mainstream theology and has you rethinking many things and evaluating a number of commonly held beliefs and saying only a tyrant would be that way. And since God is not a tyrant, that has to be wrong. Since Jesus proclaimed forgiveness and all things need to bow down to that, including your Bible interpretation, that must be wrong. Since God says to rule is to serve, then that must be wrong. Because Jesus spoke against the concept of ruling by exercising lordship and said that he who is greatest is least and he who is the chiefest of all is servant of all. And so we're going to take a look at that. But we're going to start here in a passage in 2 Corinthians where we see a couple concepts to get touched on over time and different things that are going to be overthrown ultimately and I think I'm in the wrong Corinthians I should be in 2nd Corinthians please so <laughs> now that we're in the right book of Corinthians now I Paul myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence and base among you but being absent and bold toward you but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There's some play on words here with the word flesh, because this is another common thing when reading the 
the text, whether Old Testament or New Testament, is there's often play on words where it's actually flipping around the different meanings of a word. So for another example, the word cleave means to cling to, but it also means to split apart. So you might use the word cleave in a word play where you have to think about, am I saying split apart or am I saying cling together? This is using various different meanings of the word flesh and flipping them around. So you can't insert one meaning of the word flesh in here and then keep it the same every single time the word occurs. He's actually playing around with the meanings of the words. That's uh, one of the things to understand in this passage. And that's another, this word play is another technique that's used in order to overthrow and turn ideas on its head. So he's saying that some of us think of us as if we walked according to our desires. You know, that feels good, that looks good, that tastes good. And he says, though we walk in the though we walk in the flesh, which is in your your physical skin suit, we do not war after the flesh. And then, so he's saying, we don't consider those things that seem like what religion would call hedonism. We don't see those as things to be attacked, We're, which is the Gnostic asceticism of religion, saying, you know, don't drink, don't dance, don't have fun that kind of thing. Avoid these foods uh, and and so on. And so he's saying we don't war after that. And he says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, which means they're not physical weapons, not handheld physical weapons. Um, but that they are to pulling down of strongholds. He says casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so, here's the, the statement of obedience of Christ. So, what is obedience? And that's part of where we're going to lead into this study is the idea of obedience. So, obedience means to hear and then do. And normally, this is framed under a framework of tyranny. So, it's shut up and do what you're told. Or else. And that's how we think of the word obedience. But this is actually flipping the word obedience which is also another one of the words being played with here is that the obedience of Christ is to listen to and follow the word of Christ and so if obedience isn't in the framework of tyranny it completely changes what it is, what it is to listen to and do and so if i'm giving you advice and you hear my advice, and then you do what I advised, that's obedience. But that doesn't involve the making of a demand, and that does not involve the threat of punishment. It's simply hearing what was said, and then doing it. So that's one thing to put into the context of what obedience is, is that it's not necessarily to, to shut up and do what you're told, because it's been demanded of you. And so we're going to look at how God is not a tyrant, and so obedience to God can never be shut up and do what you're told, because that's tyranny. Tyranny puts its foot on your throat and says, you do what you're told, or you face the punishment of not doing what you're told. And we see this word obedience here, and it's all throughout the New Testament, and mischaracterized because it's seen as meaning shut up and do what you're told. And it never means shut up and do what you're told in the context of what God actually wants. And it's especially flipped on its head in, in uh, certain passages that say, like, for example, obey the truth or obey the gospel. Well, do you think truth says, you know, shut up and do what you're told? The truth shall make you free indeed. How is that? How is it free to shut up and do what you're told? That doesn't make any sense. So, obedience can't be what most religion characterizes obedience as being. And we see in verse 7, in verse 6, it continues, And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay, this does not say having in readiness to 
take revenge against disobedient people. Okay, this is not about people who are disobedient. It doesn't say that. It says revenge all disobedience, which is what? It just said bringing every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Christ. So what is it talking about? It's talking about thoughts. When your obedience is fulfilled, you have a readiness to revenge those disobedient thoughts. What were the disobedient thoughts? The ones that didn't heed the advice. The ones that didn't hear and do. The ones that were against that. And it says in verse 7, Do you look on things after the outward appearance? That might be related to the topic. What is looking on things after the outward appearance? That's judging by appearances. That's judging according to the flesh. It says, If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that he is Christ, even as so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. So, we're going to see how there is no tyranny when it comes to the idea that Jesus and Paul promoted with respect to what it means to rule. And we're going to look at some of these events where this misunderstanding is played out. So we'll start in Mark chapter 10, verse 35. It says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, you know not what ye ask, can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the bapti baptism that I am baptized with? Uh, and they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called to him and saith unto them, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so it shall not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus is completely trying to undermine their thought process. They're thinking, okay, you're the Messiah. When you overthrow the Romans and sit on your throne and reign as the, as the ruler of the world, can I have a position of prestige and authority on your right hand and on your left? And he's saying, you don't get it at all. We're not going to rule over anybody. The Gentiles exercise lordship. We rule by serving. So whoever shall be great among you will be your servant. Whoever will be chiefest will be the servant of all. And so he says, The Son of Man came not to minister, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Is Jesus the exact image of the nature and character of the Father or not? Because why would God come and serve people and then demand that they f turn around and, and say, you know, hey, you need to bow down to me. That doesn't make any sense. He's Here he is overthrowing the idea of ruling by tyranny. And then God's going to rule by tyranny. His mercy is going to die when you do because you do. That doesn't make any sense. So, we want to take a look at more that he says leading up to this. And he says in Mark 9.35, If any man desire to be the first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And so this is that concept of the first and the last being flip-flopped. But like I said, they had the concept of a reversal. So the oppressed was going to become the oppressor, which means that it's just revenge. And so he takes this idea of the first and the last, but he's actually flipping flipping that over so that 
they understand that it's not that the first gets flipped over and the last get it's not a reversal but what he's doing is that the first and the last are the same thing they're the same place they're equal it's no longer a disparity it's not it's not linear where you have one side of the of the line and that's the first and the other side of the line is the last and then you take the line and flip it around and reverse it it's saying bring those two points together bring all things together into one point and it's all one same thing there's total equality so we're going to look in in Matthew and see a bigger discussion and narrative relating to the topic where we start in Matthew 20 and so th in this case it's the the mother of Zebedee's saying that the two sons sit on one the right of the hand and one on the left in thy kingdom and then in verse 22 it says but Jesus answered and said you know not what you ask are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with which kind of makes me wonder if it's really the mother because why is he telling the mother if you can be baptized but nevertheless they say unto him we are able um, and so he says to them you shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard of it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called unto them, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. So there he is saying, You will not exercise dominion over others. You will not exercise authority over, over others. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's mostly the same as what was quoted from Mark. But when we look through the continued narrative that this is part of, you can see a better overall example of what's actually happening here. So we go back to Matthew chapter 19 and back up and see what's going on. And so if we start in verse 27, it says, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you that you which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. So here it is. And so this can easily be misinterpreted through their lens. Here he is. He's saying he's going to sit on his throne of glory and they're going to sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is what's leading up to this question of saying, hey, you know, what do we have to do to get the, the throne that's closest to yours? And uh, he says, I don't think you understand what I'm even talking about because I'm not even talking about a throne in the throne room in the castle in the kingdom where we exercise authority and dominion and tyranny over people. So then he continues from there. And he starts talking about what his kingdom actually looks like. So he's, he, he now goes from saying, yeah, we're all going to sit on thrones and judge the tribes of Israel, but let me tell you what this kingdom looks like. Because it doesn't look like the kingdom that you're thinking of. It doesn't look like the Roman, the Roman Empire that we're under at the moment, except with us on the thrones instead of Caesar on the thrones. And with us on the thrones instead of Herod on the thrones. That's what their idea is, is that you just take the guy off the throne and replace it with yourself and continue the same system. Now the guys who are the oppressors, you put your foot on their throat. They're the ones under your, under your tyranny now. That's what they're thinking. And Jesus is saying that's not at all what, is going to, what it's going to be. So he starts telling this parable, explaining what the kingdom is like. And he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. 
and said unto them, Give ye also unto the go ye also unto the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith to them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right that ye shall receive. So when even was come, the lord of the vineyard saith to the steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne in the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last, for many be called, but few chosen. So he ends it by putting that that passage there again against the last first and the first last. It's it bookmarks both ends of this parable. It's it's another one of that that sandwich structure. It's bookended on both both ends about the last first and the first last because he's saying, you think that means reversal. You think that that means that this guy gets off the throne and we sit on it instead. But I'm telling you that what it means is that everything is equal. Everyone is equal. And that means that the people that put in the work are going to complain because they're getting treated equally to people that did nothing. And that's exactly what this parable is about. That God is going to be accused of being unjust because those who did nothing received every bit as much as those who worked hard. That is completely an injustice by their way of thinking. And so then it's at that point that we see that Jesus says that he's going to be, uh, you know, the, the prophecy of what's going to happen to him. And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be tr betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and they shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day shall rise again. And so that's at the point where this question about who gets to rule on his right hand and his left is. So he just told a parable saying that the reversal is not a reversal, it's an, equ it's a, an equalization. And he just said that what's going to happen to him is he's going to get killed. And then he says, do you, under, do you just not understand this cup that I'm going to be baptized with? Do you not understand what I'm talking about? And clearly they don't because they think that the thrones are thrones in the traditional sense. They think that dominion is tyranny and that there's going to be a reversal. They're still... they. The, the parable went right over their heads and they didn't get the idea that those who exercise dominion over them are not going to be put under their foot. And so to rule is to serve and to reign on a throne is really to be put up on a cross. And so that's the cross that Jesus ruled from. That was him coming into his glory. That was him judging the tribes of Israel, was when he was up on that cross and he said, Father, forgive them. Period. That was the, that was the decree. That was the judgment. Forgiveness. His throne was the cross. And so what he's saying is, yeah, you're all going to judge, judge Israel from thrones, just like me. His throne was a cross. That's the irony that they're not understanding. That's the twist in the in the story that they're not getting at this point. And so again, we see in Luke, and just to illustrate another point that I like about this, is in the Luke account, it says, There was a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? And they said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. There's the same thing. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. I love that. I love the fact that here it is. Jesus is saying, 
people like being ruled over that way because they think that the person lording over them is the one is their benefactor. They're bestowing blessings to me. I'm receiving what I'm receiving because this person is ruling over me. And so he's saying this is just the mentality that that I'm you guys are under the same mentality. That's what he's telling. Them. He's saying that you guys are under the same mentality of what it means to rule. And you think that it means to exercise lordship. Exercise lordship. And again, he says, But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that does serve. For whether is greater he that sits at meat, or he that serves, is it not he that sits at meat? But I am among you as he that serves. So here it is. If you're sitting at the table... You're supposed to be the one in the position of honor. And the person who is your servant is supposed to be the one that's really disposable to be the way that they, they would think of it. You know, you're just a worthless servant. You're disposable. I could replace you with somebody else. The one at the table is the one of esteem. The one That's the person who's being honored. And he's saying, I am as the person who is serving the one at the table. Okay, he's, again, trying to drive home the idea, we're not the ones sitting at the table. We're not the ones lording over people. We're the servant. That's what he's saying. Ye are they which have continued with me in, the t in my temptations, and I point unto you a kingdom as my Father has appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit up on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So there you go. They, they weren't understanding what this is. When he's talking about ruling, he's not talking about exercising tyranny. So then we want to look, we want to back up in the same chapter in Luke a little bit. And it says, starting in verse 13, And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Now this is important because he says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he says that he won't eat any more thereof until, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So, Drink of the fruit of the vine. Well, if you look at the Nazarene vows, fruit of the vine meant anything. It meant grape juice. It meant wine. It meant vinegar. It meant grapes. It meant raisins. Period. Anything that you, you pluck that grape off the vine, that's it. You, the Nazarite vow, vows were, were against that. So when he's talking about the fruit of the vine, he's talking about any form of it, not merely, not merely alcoholic wine. He says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Also, there's the relation here between, between the wine and the blood, because he's saying that the wine is the blood of the New Testament. But the point is that he's trying to continue to convey to them the idea that his kingdom coming is not what they think it is. Because what is his kingdom coming? And this is what's important here, is that... When he eats, when he drinks, rather, of the fruit of the vine is his kingdom coming. His kingdom is coming and it is fulfilled at the point at which he drinks of the fruit of the vine. And so we see in John 19, starting in verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar. And they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So that was him drinking of the fruit of the vine. And so now we get back to this in Second Corinthians chapter 10. And we think again on what it means to be obedient to. What is the obedience of Christ? If Christ is as the servant at the table, and his throne is a cross, an execution device, and that his kingdom comes at the point of bowing his head and giving up the ghost, having proclaimed forgiveness, what is obedience? 